Thank you everyone for uh, being here for the uh, second of our joint seminars between the economics department here at the University of New Hampshire and the Center for Health Economics and Policy Studies at San Diego State. And thank you for those of you at San Diego State joining us uh, via video. I'm very pleased to have uh, Davo Dave here today. Uh, Davo is a professor of economics at Bentley University. He's also a, a a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research associate at the Institute for Labor Economics. He's published widely in the area of the economics of health behaviors, health insurance, and human capital. Uh, his work has appeared in, in, in top journals, including the Journal of Health Economics, uh, American Journal of Health Economics, Health Economics, and uh, Journal of Law Economics. Um, his most recent work has been on uh, pharmaceutical promotions, uh, juvenile justice, welfare reform, and tobacco control policy. And uh, related to that, he's here today to present some uh, new work with his uh, colleagues on e-cigarette advertising and quit behavior uh, among smoking adults. Oh, well, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess morning to the folks in San Diego. Um, thank you, UNH. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Chaps, for having me. It's such a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I know so many of you already, so it feels like a bit of a homecoming for me. So I really appreciate that. Do um, you think they can hear me okay? All right. yes. Perfect. So um, what I want to talk about today is the e-cigarette market and specifically advertising of e-cigarettes on media and how it's been impacting um, adult smokers. So this is very much um, work in progress, so feel free to interrupt, interject with questions and comments, always appreciated. This is also very much um, joint work with my co-authors here, Dan Dench, Mike Grossman, Don Kenkel, and Henry Safer. Um, and we're doing this work, which would not have been possible without funding support from NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, so we are very grateful to them for funding support. Great. Okay, so I guess before I get started, um, just in case you know, many of us might not know, what do we actually mean with about, um, um, respect to electronic cigarettes? So what exactly are these things, e-cigarettes? Um, so e-cigarettes are the most common and the most popular form of a product category known as ENDS, electronic nicotine delivery systems. So there are e-hookers, e-pipes, e-cigars, but by far the most common and the most popular form um, in this product category are e-cigarettes. About 90% of all ENDS users are using e-cigarettes. Okay? So e-cigarettes, all of them, they have some components in common and they, they operate on a fairly um, simple mechanism. So all e-cigarettes have a liquid um, base um, that contains nicotine. There's a heating element and then there is a battery or a power source. So the heating element, a uh, heating coil basically heats up the liquid it produces vapor or aerosol, and that gets inhaled by the person who's actually consuming the e-cigarette, and that's how it, nicotine gets delivered, essentially. So the main difference, of course, is that e-cigarettes are producing vapor, they're not producing tobacco smoke, they're not producing tar, they're not producing the tobacco residue, and so they're generally construed to be a lot safer um, health-wise relative to cigarettes, essentially. So just an outline of what I want to talk about. Um, so I'll give you some background on electronic cigarettes, sort of this regulatory framework, what are the policy debates, what are the challenges that's facing the FDA, which now has authority over tobacco products. Um, it's a very, very new literature. There's a lot of room here to do work. So for any junior scholars in here, I was talking about this over lunch. Um, the tobacco landscape has been changing drastically year to year. There are new policies coming into place. Just a few days ago, the FDA came out saying that it's considering even new, more policy and more restrictions on the tobacco market. So there's a lot of room here for new research. And again, all of a sudden, tobacco research is sort of sexy again. It's sort of making a comeback. Um, so I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the literature that bears on what we're doing, um, the contributions that we're making both to the literature and to the policy discussion. So we're also using some very unique data, um, again, made possible because we have the funding. And so I'll talk about the unique data sets that we're using for this study. It's always very difficult to identify the causal impact of advertising, right? People who get exposed to advertising are not a random subset. So I'll talk about our identification strategy, what variation are we relying on to get us that causal impact, talk about our results. So the question that we posed with the paper is, does e-cigarette advertising encourage adult smokers to quit smoking? And the short answer to that is, yes, it does for TV advertising. 
And so what we are finding is that an exposure to maybe three additional TV ads raises the probability of successfully quitting smoking by about 0.3 percentage points. So that's about a 3% effect relative to the mean, just to give you guys an idea about the magnitude. And then finally, what are the implications of what we're finding for policy and how it could potentially help the FDA and the CDC? Okay. Right. So here's a brief background um, on the timeline for e-cigarettes. So the first sort of um, commercially successful, the modern version of e-cigarettes um, were introduced in China. They were invented in China by a Chinese pharmacist. The saying goes, the story goes that his dad had passed away from lung cancer and so he was looking for a way to invent something that would help someone inhale nicotine in a relatively safe manner, essentially. Um, E-cigarettes entered the U.S. market in 2007, 2008. Um, they really started taking off in 2010, 2011. In 2009, President Obama signed the Tobacco Control Act, which basically gave the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regulatory authority over tobacco products. Right? One of the first things that it did, the FDA did, was it, it banned candy and fruit-flavored cigarettes. So it found that these types of cigarettes were really appealing to youth, and so these types of cigarettes are now banned from the market. In 2010, Minnesota became the first state to tax e-cigarettes. So cigarettes tend to be taxed everywhere, all states to varying degrees. E-cigarette taxes are still not yet that popular. Minnesota was the first one to do this in 2010. So currently there are about 10 states that are starting to tax e-cigarettes. So again, a lot of potential here to do research on that. These states are just starting to come up with these e-cigarette taxes. No one's really done a lot of work on e-cigarette taxes yet. Um, so we finally are starting to see that policy variation come into play. 2011, oh, Karen? Sure. So the fruit flavor, that was just regular cigarettes. That's just regular cigarettes, exactly. Cigarettes. That's a that, it, okay. Yes, thank you very much. So yes, the, 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 the ban on the fruit flavors, that's just on the regular cigarettes. So flavored e-cigarettes are still available, but the FDA has really started cracking down on that starting in 2018. Um, and the recent rumblings are that the FDA may even consider banning menthol cigarettes. So menthol cigarettes are still on the market, there is some evidence coming in that they're especially attractive to kids and African-Americans. And the FDA is starting to think about, hey, maybe we should also ban the menthol cigarettes as well. Yeah. Right. So in 2011, the FDA decided that it's going to actually regulate electronic cigarettes um, as a normal tobacco product rather than a drug or a medical device. Um, initially, it had thought that maybe it wanted to sort of regulate e-cigarettes as a drug or a medical device. Um, there was a lot of lawsuits back and forth they lost some of these lawsuits. And so in the end, they said, okay, we will regulate it as a normal conventional tobacco product. 2016, um, there was a national ban that was put into place um, on e-cigarette sales to minors. Again, by this time though, most states already had their own ban. So there's a lot of policy variation for youth access to e-cigarettes that's already there. So if anyone wants to do studies on that, there's a lot of room there as well. Um, and then, the FDA also at some point in 2011, 2012 had said that all e-cigarette manufacturers, um, you're required to submit a pre-market application, just like drugs are, right? So if you're an FDA, if you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer, you want your drug to be on the market, you have to submit an application to the FDA. The FDA approves your application. If the drug gets approved, then you have the ability to sell your drug. So they wanted to do that same thing with e-cigarettes. If they had succeeded in doing that, what that would mean is that all current e-cigarettes in the market would need to be taken off the market. They would need to submit an application to the FDA. The FDA would review those applications. It's a very lengthy process. And then once the approval happens, then those products can start entering the market again. So in 2017, the FDA said, okay, we're going to push that off until 2022. So that process is still there on the books, but it's not required yet until 2022. And there's a possibility it may be even pushing back even further. Okay. Okay. So these are just some trends in e-cigarette use and smoking. Um, nothing that should surprise anyone. The top graph is basically just showing um, that e-cigarette use has been increasing for all sort of age groups. And I'll break these down further. And the bottom graph is just showing the decline in smoking participation for all age groups as well. Okay. Let's look at youth in particular. So these are trends for youth, right? These are basically high school students. The blue line is participation in e-cigarettes, e-cigarette use, right? So the nice thing is that for youth, we actually do have a consistent data set that has measured e-cigarette use since 2011. That's the National Youth Tobacco Survey from the CDC. 
So in 2011, e-cigarette use among youth was 1.5%, all right? The latest numbers in 2018, it went up to 21%, all right? And notice, this is what was really causing the FDA a lot of concern. This jump in just one year from 11% to 21%. And so this was a big cause of concern for the FDA, and that's why they really started cracking down on Juul's. So that's the sort of most popular e-cigarette brand right now. They have like 70, 75% market share. And so this is why they're taking a very, very strong stance on youth access to e-cigarettes. The FDA is currently saying that they want to see one more year of data for youth before deciding how hard they want to go on e-cigarettes. Regan? Juul or Juul's, are those the flavored ones that have all those different flavors? Yeah, so they also, they, they, yeah, they, they do come in flavored ones as well. They also come in just normal menthol as well as normal nicotine. But yeah, but they're the ones that look like USB flash drives um, and they have pods. The thing about Juul's is that they changed the technology a little bit. The normal e-cigarettes are based on a nicotine liquid. So Juul started using nicotine salts. And so that's supposed to give people a more smoother experience. I should not be selling Juul's to you guys. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> all right. but that's why they got so popular, right? It's, it's supposed to um, mimic the, the behavioral aspects of, of actually smoking. That's why they got really popular as well. And this, they also have a stronger nicotine content than the other e-cigarettes did. Okay. Yes. Seventeen. Is there any? Is it just noisy data, or is it? Because otherwise, it looks. Yep. Like it's flat. So that's a that's a great question, Karen. Right. So I think this thing over here may actually have been a real decline, right? So what happened was between 2016 and 2017, that's when Juul started entering the market, and so this increase that you're seeing from 2016 to 2017 to 2018, that's the entire Juul phenomenon, actually. Right. They started out maybe with maybe a 3% market share and they built up to a 75% market share today. Yeah, please. This is a survey, right? Just yes, yes. This is self-reported data. But if we had actually done this using um, scanner data, sales data from scanners convenience store, it would show very much similar trends as well. But you, is allowed, I mean, can they legally buy this? Um, Technically, no, right? With the bans in um, national bans in 2016, right? They're technically not able to, but they still have access to it. So if you look at the National Youth Tobacco Survey, they ask, you know, the youth who basically have access to e-cigarettes, they say, how do you get this? About 20, 25% said they got it from the internet. So online sales are still possible. Um, another 25% said they just bought it themselves. And another 45% say they got it from other sources, maybe getting a friend to buy it from them or getting it from someone who's 18 years old or 19 years old and just borrowing it from them. Yeah. Is the band okay. part of the drop? Um, yeah, so that's a good point. The band could be part of the drop. The thing is, by the time this happened, though, most states have already done it, actually. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, okay. Okay. So the other thing that should be also, um, you should note, is this downward trend in just smoking participation among youth, essentially. Okay. Um, there's not really too much of a visual break in the smoke trend um, when electronic cigarettes are entering the market. Um, nevertheless, a couple of points I want to make about the smoking trend is, of course, smoking participation has been going down among youth because initiation has been going down. So there are less kids who are just starting to smoke. Now, it's possible that some of these kids are switching over to e-cigarettes, but given the fact that you have 21% of these kids who are now using e-cigarettes, it's also possible that many of them are just new users to nicotine. Yeah? Surveys designing like intensity of like e-cigarette smoking because it's different than like oh I smoke five cigarettes a day. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a really good point. Um, so the National Youth Tobacco Survey and I believe might have been the MTF. Um, they just started asking this, so they capture intensity based on just how many days do you basically use e-cigarettes. So if someone says I use e-cigarettes, then they say how many days do you use it? Seven days of the week, five days, or it's maybe a past month period. But they don't quite say how many packs are you using it or, or how many times are you puffing? So there is no intensity of use message, it's more of a frequency measure. Please. Is there any evidence on, on kind of once you try, you stay, you know, how many, how, how many is triers continue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you look at, um, in a couple of slides later, I'll show you the, the evidence for adults. Um, the evidence for youth is still ongoing. Um, for adults, what happens is that you have a lot of them who actually tried these cigarettes at some point in the past. Um, maybe about half of them to 40% of them continue to be current users. So two phenomena here, right? One po potential possibility is that these are experimenters. A new product comes into the market. They are curious about it. They start trying it. Maybe it's not for them, or maybe they just wean themselves off of that. Or the second thing is some of these adults might be using it to quit smoking, 
they end up quitting smoking, then they also end up not using e-cigarettes after that as well. Okay, so this is similar trends for adults. The problem with adults is that we don't have a continuous data set that has tracked e-cigarette use for adults since 2010, 2011, unfortunately. Some of the big data sets like the NHIS, the Burfus, just started adding their e-cigarette questions. But if you look at the prevalence rate for adults, you know, these data sets suggest that right now, maybe about 7% of adults are using e-cigarettes. These are smoking trends. The red line is just smoking participation over time. The green line is just everyday smokers over time. Um, there's a little bit of maybe a mild acceleration of the smoking participation decline after e-cigarettes were entering the market. We don't want to make too much out of that. The other point I want to make about these trends is that this trend for adults is not, of course, picking up the initiation margin. You know, this trend is going on because of the cessation margin, right? You know, adults, you know, if you're not smoking into adulthood, you're not all of a sudden going to start smoking. This decrease in smoking participation is coming because more and more adults are now starting to quit smoking, essentially. And so these are the figures I was talking about before. You know, this is basically lifetime e-cigarette users, and these are current e-cigarette users. About 40% of them who've tried e-cigarette users use in the past end up being current e-cigarette users as well. The main point about this is who are the e-cigarette users among adults? For kids, it seems like these are new nicotine users. These are kids who had no prior history of nicotine use now entering the market with jewels and e-cigarettes. For adults, if you ask e-cigarette users, current e-cigarette users, and you see their smoking participation in the past, most current e-cigarette users are either current smokers or past smokers. If you've never smoked a cigarette in your life, there's very, very little chance that you're gonna start using e-cigarettes, right? If you also ask current e-cigarette users, why are you using e-cigarettes? About 75% of them say that I'm using e-cigarettes because I want to quit smoking, I want to cut down on smoking. Now, at the same time that e-cigarette use has been going up, advertising uh, in the e-cigarette market has also been increasing, right? So this is magazine advertising. This is TV advertising from our data. Before 2012, there was virtually no advertising whatsoever, right? So advertising between 2012 and 2014 increased by about a factor of 10 to 15 times. It went down in 2015, and then it's back up again, trending back up again since 2015, essentially, right? So in this paper, we're gonna focus on magazine and TV ads, why? Because these two are the po most popular media that carry e-cigarette advertising, right? They make up about 90% of e-cig ads. Yeah? What do you know about the cost or the price of e-cigarettes relative to cigarettes, and also if that's been changing over time, because yeah. new products sort of come cheaper? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so if you're using e-cigarettes properly, right, then they're much cheaper for you than smoking conventional cigarettes. So for instance, um, a pack of cigarettes in Massachusetts would cost about $10. An e-cigarette equivalent of a pack of cigarettes would be about $4, right? Um, so they're a lot cheaper. What's been going on with the prices of e-cigarettes over time, there's been a slight downward trend since about 2011. So we know this from the scanner data. If we just basically get a price index of e-cigarettes, track it over time, it's about, it's trending downwards, not heavily, but slightly downwards. But quality of e-cigarettes has improved a lot over the last seven, eight years. So the quality adjusted price has had a substantial decline. Any questions? Yeah, please. Do you have any information on online advertisement? Because I feel like you can be more exposed to that than I can. Fair, uh, great point. Um, so in this paper, we're not looking at youth, we're only looking at adults, you're absolutely right. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have data on online advertising for youth. Um, we're writing a new proposal, which is hopefully going to get that data from Nielsen. What we have as part of this project is we have Twitter data. So we have um, Twitter data on all e-cigarette related tweets. And we know whether the tweet originated organically through the individual, or originated commercially because these companies are tweeting about their product, and how many retweets are being done about that. That's not part of this data set right now because it's adults. So at some point we want to bring that in, but no, I mean, that's the extent of what we have with respect to online exposure to these things. And by the way, so e-cigarettes are allowed to advertise on magazines and TV, but you've never seen a conventional cigarette advertised on television. And they've stopped advertising on magazines several years ago. So what's the motivation for public policy and what's the motivation for public health? Well, 
So as I said, e-cigarettes don't really produce tobacco smoke. They produce vapor, they produce aerosol, right? Um, and the nitrosamines, which are the carcinogenic sort of chemicals found in, in tobacco, is much lower in e-cigarettes than it is in conventional cigarettes. So the Royal College of Physicians, which is UK-based, they estimated that e-cigarettes have only about 5% of the health risk of a conventional cigarette. So Kip Viscusi, he's estimated that e-cigarettes have only about 1% of the health risk of conventional cigarettes. Right? Some studies say it's 10%, some studies say it's 20%. So the numbers go back and forth. But the main point is e-cigarettes are construed to be a lot safer than cigarettes. So one aspect of, pub yeah, please. No, I'm curious because we are very worried lately that e-cigarettes right. is so harmful. Like Correct. The same word. So it, it, it's not completely safe. Um, and in fact, just two days ago, there was a report in the New York Times that the FDA is starting to look at this um, link between e-cigarette use and seizures. Exactly. Um, you know, if you overdose on nicotine, it does lead to the probability of having a seizure. That's been established in the clinical literature. One of the issues with e-cigarettes is, and I found this from anecdotal evidence, is that with cigarettes, you know exactly what you're smoking. You smoke a pack, you smoke two cigarettes. E-cigarettes, e it's hard to regulate how much actual nicotine you're taking in. Right? You don't know, have I smoked two cigarettes? Have I smoked one pack? And so there is the possibility that that in itself may lead consumers to consume more than they intended to. And so, yes, they're, they're, that leads to poisonings and that leads to these things over here. But Ceres Paribus, right, comparing a one pack of cigarettes to an equivalent one pack of e-cigarettes, the general sort of consensus is they're supposed to be a lot safer. So one aspect is, look, if these are safer, you have a lot of um, smokers who have a tough time quitting smoking. You know, of course, we would love it that they quit completely, but maybe if they went on to e-cigarettes and use e-cigarettes to quit smoking, and even if they stayed on e-cigarettes, maybe that's not a bad thing. That's still a um, public health improving scenario, right? Yeah, Joe? What does Kip say about the, the people's beliefs, right, about, about the relative right. risks of right. e-cigarettes and, and that's absolute. So the experts say that e-cigarettes are a lot safer. But if I ask you guys, right, you might have probably overestimated that risk, right? If I say, hey, how much do you guys think are e-cigarettes safer relative to cigarettes? You would, you would not have said 5%. You would not have said 1%, right? And so, yes, um, if you just ask the general public about what their perceptions are, the latest results suggest that maybe about two-thirds of adults in the U.S., they believe that e-cigarettes are just as harmful, if not more, relative to cigarettes. So they overestimate the risk of e-cigarettes. And of course, they also overestimate the risk of cigarettes. If you just ask someone and say, hey, smoking, what's the chance that you will die from smoking with lung cancer? Like the average risk of mortality from lung cancer from smoking is like 8%. But if you ask a person, what do you guys think is the mortality risk of lung cancer with smoking? They will say something like 40%. So yes, people do overestimate the perceived risk here, for sure. Okay. The other side of the argument is, of, of course, youth, right? This is what the FDA is concerned about, right? So on the one hand, it could be helping adults, but for youth, it could may lead to a gateway effect, may lead them to smoke more. Or even if they're just using more e-cigarettes, that's not a good thing. Nicotine has been found to have some developmental consequences for adolescents, right? So if e-cigarettes can be an effective cessation device, then there is a role for advertising, right? Advertising could potentially um, correct these misperceptions, and it could potentially help e-cigarettes reach a wider audience. And maybe in that sense, the FDA should not be banning advertising completely. Right? But that's what we want to find out in this paper. So several states and the American College of Physicians, unlike their UK counterpart, have actually urged the FDA to ban advertising of e-cigarettes, right? The FDA said, no, we're not going to ban advertising right now. They're taking a wait and see approach. Starting last year, they are requiring the ads to carry a warning message, essentially that, hey, e-cigarettes have nicotine, nicotine can be addictive. But the current status quo is that the FDA is allowing the advertising of e-cigarettes to go on as long as these companies are not making any explicit health claims or cessation claims. Right. So some relevant literature, um, not a lot of literature here, guys, um, but I'll just quickly take you through two strands of, the, of studies that are relevant for us. So one is, first of all, how effective are e-cigarettes as a smoking device? Yeah, it's, you know, people they say that they're using e-cigarettes to quit. You know, is there any evidence that they really are effective as, as a cessation device? 
So there's a bunch of studies in the public health literature. This is all basically association-based studies, um, cross-sectional evidence, or just following up smokers over time, which is not the best thing, selection bias and all that. Um, and the evidence here is mixed. You know, some studies find that e-cigarettes are associated with no quitting or less quitting, and then some studies find that it's associated with more quitting. Karen? I need to just miss this. Sure. Defining quitting, is it quitting any tobacco products or quitting cigarettes? That's a great question. So here they're specifically defining quitting cigarettes, conventional cigarettes. Yes, yes. So those who don't quit are actually doing, maybe doing two things. They may be doing that's right. So there's, part, there's the possibility of dual use as well. So if you're using e-cigarettes, you don't quit. Maybe you might have cut down on the number of cigarettes, which is probably not a bad thing for yourself, as well as from an environmental tobacco smoke perspective. Um, but yes, um, so if you're not quitting, then you're continuing to use cigarettes. Yeah. And so there's smokeless tobacco and other things as well. It's a very small percent of the market, so we're not bringing that in here. And there's a couple of studies um, that have actually done RCTs on this, which I'll talk about, and some series of nice studies that are coming out from Jody Sindelar and her group at Yale. So they do these discrete choice experiments. They basically get a sample of smokers, and they just give them different choices, you know, different choices between e-cigarettes and cigarettes. Um, these are stated preferences, not revealed preferences. They're basically giving them all of these different choices of products. Um, they have different price and non-price attributes, and they ask people to make choices based on that. So based on what people choose, you can actually figure out what are they valuing? What type of attributes are they valuing? And so there's some evidence from those studies that, you know, look, smokers really do value e-cigarettes for their health aspects, as well as, as well as for the aspects that they could help them quit smoking. A couple of cool RCTs, this one was done in New Zealand. They looked at smokers. Um, they divided up smokers into two groups. One group, uh, actually three groups. One group got the nicotine e-cigarettes. One group got the NRT, these are nicotine replacement therapy. These are your patches, your lozenges, your nicotine gum. And then one group got the placebo e-cigarettes, meaning those were e-cigarettes with no nicotine in it, right? And they basically followed you know, these individuals over six months and they looked at their smoking abstinence rates. The highest abstinence rate was with the nicotine e-cigarettes and then the lowest was with the placebo group. And a recent study, this one's a cool one. This is New England Journal of Medicine just came out. This was done as part of the UK's National Health Service. Again, smokers randomized into two groups, NRT, nicotine replacement therapy, and e-cigarettes. And they found that the one-year abstinence rate was almost double in the e-cigarette group relative to the, um, to the NRT group, right? Of course, the RCTs only tell you what happens if you actually give these people e-cigarettes, right? The question is, how do we actually do this in the general population? Could advertising be that instrument through which we get people closer to e-cigarettes. Right. Um, the NRT and yeah. the they, they, they give you the same high? I mean, uh, it's just you're getting nicotine without the tobacco. That's correct, exactly. So in a, in a sense, they're both different ways of giving you nicotine, right? One is doing it through oral gum patches. The other one is doing it through inhalation, right? Um, the level of nicotine does vary between NRT and, and, and e-cigarettes. So that's a good question. My, my understanding is that the NRT comes in different doses. So you can actually buy NRT with different levels and strengths of nicotine. But on average, NRT will probably deliver less nicotine than the e-cigarettes would. So you, you know, one concern might be, hey, what you're picking up here is the nicotine effect, maybe not the e-cigarette effect. Absolutely. Right, fair enough. The other standard of literature is advertising, right? Advertising is very, very new in this literature. There's not a lot of studies on this. As far as we know, only three studies. Um, the couple of studies by Zhang, published in Health Economics and published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, and a recent uh, working paper by Anna Tuckman at Northwestern. All three of these papers use aggregate data. They use city-level data, essentially. So they're measuring advertising at the city level, and they're basically relating that to sales. What are the sales of e-cigarettes, sales of cigarettes? Um, Zeng and co-authors, they basically find that cities that have more television advertising for e-cigarettes tend to have fewer sales of e-cigarettes, and they also tend to have fewer sales of cigarettes. Anna's paper, she also finds that in those cities where there's more advertising of e-cigarettes, sales of e-cigarettes goes down, but sales of, um, I'm sorry, the other way around, um, sales of e-cigarette goes up and sales of cigarettes goes down, essentially, right? Question? Yeah, so I'm curious how you think the, like, the public health world views that last result. So kind of abstract away from the right. about youth initiation. All right. Do they see this as a welfare gain or are they all or nothing? So that's a good question. So this paper is still a working paper, but if I had to take this as is, 
right? I think she is using scanner data as well from Nielsen. So it's household level purchase data. So it's hard to know exactly who within the household is actually using that product. But overall, if it is reducing six sales, my personal interpretation of that would be, forget the youth, forget all of that, you know, that would be well for improving, right? Given that, look, the substitution of one bad product for another product which is less bad, I mean, all else equal is public health improvement. Okay. One issue with aggregate data, of course, is um, measurement error. You are essentially assuming that everybody in that area is exposed to that same level of advertising. And the other issue is, if you're comparing cities with each other, right, you're only relying on what's known as local ads. Most e-cigarette advertising is national. About 90% of more of e-cigarette ads are just shown all over the United States, they're national ads. And so you're only relying on maybe less than 10% of the variation in local ads across different media markets. Right? Well, depends, yes, even one problem is the indigenous Right, right, right. Think sure. Firms would be... Hey, absolutely, that's very true. So if you think firms are basically um, targeting ads to some markets on a differential basis than other markets, uh, <laughs> yes, they're not. So I think Anna does a slightly better job at it. She's borrowing from the minimum wage literature where they're basically comparing contiguous counties. So people living on both sides of a media market, you know, one side is exposed to more, one side is exposed to that slightly better, but still relying on that same cross city variation. So back to the point about what advertising is doing, right. whether it's sort of serving as a, as, a, as a signal to people about the relative health risks, given that they can't see any tobacco advertising, that this, a lot of that has been right. regulated away, or is this providing information about the availability of the product? Has there been any even just sort of descriptive work inside that black box of, of, of what the advertising of e-cigarette yeah. in particular is? To yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, very little work on that. A um, couple of things, the ads, if you actually look at the ads for e-cigarettes themselves, um, even though explicitly they're not able to say that e-cigarettes are healthier or they can help you quit, there are implicit claims there. So there is an informational transmission going on that if you're a smoker, you're not quite aware that there could be options for you, e-cigarettes may be helping you do that. Um, there is also one study from Florida which basically took a group of people they showed them a very popular ad for e-cigarette, which made no claims about quitting. And they asked them, what did this ad made you think about? They said, it made us think, about 75% of the samples said, it made me think about quitting smoking. So there was some evidence that it could just be serving as this public service announcement saying, hey, you're a smoker, you can quit, e-cigarettes can help you out. Just like the old NRT ads or the CDC stood campaign ads, which basically get people to call the hotline. So there was some evidence that it might be serving that purpose as well. Yes, please. Do the ads seem geared to, I mean, the, the growth you showed us, is especially amongst the jewels are the youth market, right? So if I were advertising, I'd try to make, make my ads appealing to youth without being too obvious about it so that the CDC leaves me alone, right? right? Is there some of that? Yeah, so they obviously are very careful about not doing that anymore. Um, so you might have finally seen Juul ads on TV. They started campaigning just this year. Um, you might actually have seen a Juul ad on television, it's only on radio. Um, and so they promised to the FDA that they will explicitly not go after the youth market. In terms of the ads that we have access to, one trend that we've seen is that they are not being advertised specifically on youth-oriented shows. But what's happened is that the ads are being placed more on shows that are, have wider appeal. So like they get aired on shows like Big Bang Theory. They get aired on shows like Law and Order that really all have this big demographics. I mean, of course, if some of those are youth, then they're being exposed to that as well. Right. So contributions, all of that comes up. Hopefully, I don't need to say that, you know, at this point, we are providing the first study that is specifically looking at e-cigarette advertising and quits. The other three papers only looked at sales. And again, sales can do anything. Um, we're also exploring really, really rich data on consumers um, and getting some of the most detailed measures of who's being exposed to this advertising and who's not. Um, this is an improvement over all of these other studies that have just used aggregate data. And finally, as, you know, as, because we have very detailed measures of actually who watches what show and what magazine do they actually read, we're able to push causal inference. We're able to really push the endogeneity concerns here. Okay. So these are just some ads. Um, I think I might have talked to you about that. <laughs> Sorry, I had to black some of the stuff out, guys. They're, some of them are really racy. Um, but essentially, you know, all of these ads are, are making 
three major sort of points implicitly. One is that e-cigarettes are healthier for you potentially. One is that, look, you can use e-cigarettes to smoke even when smoking is not allowed, right? So some people might be using e-cigarettes as a way to circumvent smoking restrictions. And one is that, look, it could help you quit. So just some ads, you guys can, all that, okay. So in terms of e-cigarette ads, I think this sort of come up, came up in our discussion, what type of things are these e-cigarette ads conveying? Right, on the one hand, um, you know, these e-cigarette ads could be conveying information. There's an informative content to that. The e-cigarette manufacturers are borrowing a lot of the playbook from the old tobacco ads. So it's a lot of lifestyle ads, a lot of, you know, social aspects to these ads. So from a Becker Murphy standpoint of advertising, you know, it's a complement to the product. It'd be raising the marginal utility of consumption. But again, the effects could go either way. It could be helping adults quit or it could be making them into dual users, right? You could now continue to use e-cigarettes and smoke at the same time, especially if before that smoking restriction might have gotten you to quit. Now you have e-cigarettes, you can use them to circumvent the smoking restrictions. They could actually just perpetuate that nicotine addiction, right? So a priori, even if adults are saying they're using it to quit, empirically it could go either way. Karen? Is, um, is there much evidence on, is there any sort of secondhand issues with these things. I'm thinking about people who might quit, normally quit because they may have children and don't right. And would they, I mean, is there any evidence there or what do people believe? Um, quitting because I, I'm more the impact of e-cigs if there's the second hand is there any sort of oh hand? oh I see I see that's a great or, question. Or threat of yes poisoning or, or whatever. Yes yeah that, right right that's a good question. I'll, you know what, I am not sure if there's actually any studies that have looked at that from a family context, right? People have done that for smoking, right? And we've done that for smoking ourselves. Um, for e-cigarettes, the, the clinical evidence is that the vapor is relatively safe. Um, you know, um, and I, I walk in New York City and sometimes I see smoke coming at me and my first instinct is, is that a cigarette or is that an e-cigarette? If it's a cigarette, I move out of the way. If it's an e-cigarette, I just continue walking essentially. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but the... <laughs> But the, but the clinical evidence is that it, it's supposed to be safer. Um, um, and so even if it's cutting down on smoking, right, um, and you're just substituting e-cigarettes for cigarettes, right, it is going to reduce people's exposure to that more harmful secondhand smoke. But, but yeah, the, the, if they're able to quit. Okay. Yes, yes, that's a great question. Um, th again, that's, that's future research. That's, that's room for studies here, for sure. Um, you could potentially do that with the NHIS. The NHIS has just started asking e-cigarette questions. There's good data on um, in the NHIS so in terms of where people are smoking and where they're using e-cigarettes. Um, and so if they're doing it in the presence of family members, that could tell you something about how well they're perceiving the risk of the environmental tobacco smoke. Sure. Right. So here's our data set, right? So our primary data set is the National Consumer Study. This is the Simmons National Consumer Study. It's nationally representative um, of all adults in the US. Um, it's a proprietary data set. And this is also a data set that's also used by most advertising firms and marketing firms themselves. So again, you know, advertising firms have clients. The clients want the advertising firms to place ads for those clients. And so they need data to figure out, hey, where should we target our ads? Where should we place our ads? So when they need to do that, this is the data set that they go to. So it's kind of cool that we have access to the same data set that the advertisers themselves are using to target their ads, right? Um, the nice thing about this data set is that it has detailed measures of every TV show and every magazine that is read by each respondent and viewed by each respondent in the data set. So we are using data over nine quarters. That gives us about almost 60,000 observation total. Um, the data set's extremely pricey because they cater to industry, not to academia. Um, so if you try to buy very, very recent data, it's, it's a very discontinuous jump in the price. If you try to buy older data, it's a slightly lower price. So we are finally getting updated data to be able to add on to the study or do other things with this. And so since we're specifically interested in the quit margin, you know, people who quit, you know, our sample is limited to everyone who's quit in the past year and current smokers, right? So this will include three groups. This will include people who have actually attempted to quit and have successfully quit. It includes people who have attempted to quit and failed, and also includes people who have just never attempted to quit. All right, just some um, descriptive statistics. So in our sample, about 37% basically makes an attempt to quit smoking in the past year. Right, this is very much in line with data from the CPS as well actually, right? So among those individuals who actually attempt to quit smoking, some of them will fail and some of them will succeed. 
So about 24% of those individuals who actually attempt to quit smoking end up quitting successfully. The other 76% fail. Okay? We also have data, so if you've made an attempt to quit smoking, we know what method did you use, right? So about 24% of those who are actually attempting to quit smoking are doing so using e-cigarettes, right? Um, about 18% are using NRT or cold turkey. And the other remainder, 40%, is a hodgepodge, you know, acupuncture, hypnosis, mixed methods, all of that. Okay. And then we can, you know, these are just descriptive statistics. So again, take it with a grain of salt. This is a selected sample. But if you look at success rates among those who use e-cigarettes, about 29% of them actually succeed. Among those who use NRT, about 27 succeed. Right? And then the lowest success rate is for the other category, which is kind of in line with the clinical evidence, hypnosis, acupuncture, all these things have not really been shown to be too effective in helping you quit smoking. Yeah. Uh, if, if you, everybody who does E6 in the sample is trying to quit. That's a great question. So that's, in the, in the, in the, in the data sets that we have, e-cigarette was basically probed only in the context of quitting. So they ask these individuals, these individuals say, hey, I tried to quit smoking over this past year. And then the follow-up question is, which of these methods did you use to quit smoking? So there is no standalone question on do you just use e-cigarettes. So this really is tied specifically to the quitting. Yeah. Do people use e-cigarettes? Yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so right now it goes in here. So these are mixed methods. Um, if I take the e-cigs out from here and put them here, if I take the NRTs and put them here, there's some double counting, but doing that doesn't change anything else later on. Right, okay. So the next data set that we got is from Cantor Media, right? So we have this NCS data that tells us, hey, what shows are you watching? What magazines are you reading? So from the Cantor data, we actually got data on where the e-cigarette ads appeared. So this tells us on what shows did actually an e-cigarette ad appear? And what magazines did an e-cigarette ad appear? So every time an e-cigarette ad appeared, we know what program it aired on, we know the time slot, we know the channel, we know the length of the ad, and whether the ad was national or whether it was local. If it was local, we know what market it aired on. Okay? Um, and the same thing with magazines. We know what magazine issue the ad actually appeared in, the size of the ad, um, and so on. And as I said, these two things account for about 90% of all ad spending. Regan? a bigger picture question. But sure. At what, you're saying the main year on but at what point do you start losing some power here because of the way people watch TV? So I can't remember when I started, but right yep. now I turn my cable on for Patriots games yeah. and maybe two shows a week. Right, right. And everything else is um, Amazon Prime and yep. things like Netflix or Hulu. That's, the, that's a great point, yes. I mean, it's bad for research, but I feel like more and more people are either watching it, streaming it on their computers, or like Amazon Flash Drive. Right, or, right. So for sure, right? Um, so your, your question is, at what point do you start losing power? My answer is, we lose power at every point. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just remember like 13, 14, 15, when that really started kicking in. So I'll, um, I'll show you, a, maybe I'll show you a study. Nielsen did a study in 2014. So our data starts in late 2015. So about a two years before this, Nielsen did a study where they found that 85% of all time spent watching TV happens in live real time and it happens on the traditional screen. Okay. So of course we are using data that's maybe two years after that. So it's probably gone down since then for sure. Um, and so you absolutely, right? So what that would do for us is, is, is this exposure measure, it's gonna be a little bit more probabilistic, right? We, you mean, we know that you watch that program, we know an ad aired when you're watching that program, but maybe you skip that commercial, maybe you watched it on a screen when that ad did not appear. Um, the nice thing is that since we are matching specifically based on the person's own information about what time and what channel they watched it on versus, hey, did you watch this on Hulu or did you watch this on Netflix? Yeah. Right? It gets us a little bit more cleanly that they really are watching the shows at those times. Yeah. But that's a really good point, though. Yeah, and it, it may have a demographic. For sure, yeah, yeah. The younger versus yeah, the young people. Are the yeah, indeed. Young people are gravitating away. Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Do you have the same issue with the magazines? Uh, so, right. right. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the, the issue with magazines, of course, is you know, magazine readership overall has been trending downwards. Television re, um, viewership has been relatively stagnant. It has actually not trended downwards. But with magazines, it's much more easier to skip an ad, right? You, know, you, you have an issue, 
you just flip the page, right? But television, you know, maybe there's a higher cost involved to skipping an ad. You know, you actually have to wake up or get up or switch the channel and so on. So when we find no effects for magazine ads later on, we believe it's partly because magazine readership has gone down. It's not sort of catching up a lot of people and just it's so easy for people to just flip the page. Are young people reading magazines? Yeah, um, in, so in our data, we, our, our young people is basically 18 to 24. And so about maybe 40% of them are reading magazines. That seems that's, it, that's high, I know, I know. But they could be reading magazines, again, on, on, on their tablets or on their phones, right? That captures anything like that, too. Yeah, please. I was wondering, is your data capturing ad placements in the shows? Yes, that's correct. Then they may, you know, that, that Netflix Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So I have I have Xfinity and I have DVR. Um, and so what happens is that you know sometimes I watch the show after live, after it aired live. And so for the first week, there's no way I can fast forward with those ads. But if I watch that show a month later, then those ads are gone. So you're, you're absolutely right. So they could still be exposed to the ad if they're watching it within say maybe a period of seven days to fourteen days. Um, so how do we measure um, e-cigarette advertising exposure on television, right? So broadly speaking, we're doing this by basically matching up the ads that are placed on each show, on each channel, program, time slot, based on the respondents reporting that they watched that show, that time, that channel, and so on. You know, one issue with this is that I know that a person watches Law & Order. I know he watches it on NBC. I know he watches it maybe from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock but I don't know that he watched it yesterday when it actually aired. So typically the way that these questions are recorded is that do you watch Law & Order? What channel do you watch it on? What time slot do you watch it on? And how often do you watch it? Not did you watch it specifically on this Thursday? So people will say, hey, I watch Law & Order every week that it airs. Or I watch Law & Order three out of four weeks or two out of four weeks or one out of four weeks. And so we have to assign these weights that captures that frequency. That's the only wrinkle with that. And so what we're doing is we're summing up the total number of TV ads that a person is exposed to over the past six months, right? Why six months? Um, we play around that with a little bit. You know, there's some evidence from the advertising literature that advertising is both a stock and a flow. You know, if I'm exposed to advertising, the effect may not just be short-lived, it can be persistent over time. And so it allowed for that cumulative aspect we're using a six-month look-back period. Um, I will show you some results later on where I'll basically try to relax that assumption and our results don't change that much. Karen? I mean, you make it to this. I'm sure. just thinking you're going to be exposed to more ads if you watch more TV. That's correct. Yes. And so we control for the total amount of time that you're watching TV. Yes. Okay. And, all right. Yes. That's just, important. Yeah, please. Just a, I don't know what to think of this, but um, I just, I, when I was in England a few years ago, every person I saw with an e-cigarette was a man over 50 and overweight. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm 52, I'm overweight, but I don't think, mm. I think it was likely a part of cigarette smoking succession. Right. They were married, sitting, they were traveling in right. tourist areas. Is, is there, a, and all the e-cigarettes that I know, and when I walk by, it's always uh, fruit-flavored, cotton candy. Yeah. Are, are e-cigarettes also used for weight loss? That's a great question. I know cigarettes are used for weight loss. Um, E-cigarettes could potentially have that effect because it's nicotine. Nicotine is a appetite suppressant. Um, it's I, potentially I there. Much, I wonder how much nicotine is an appetite suppressant. If this is really relatively low nicotine. No, no. So, so high, it no, it could be high. It could be high. So the typical e-cigarette has just as much, almost as much nicotine as cigarettes do. Again, e-cigarettes are also sold in ver um, varying levels and doses. But that's a research question. I don't know if any question that has specifically studied that issue. I think it's a good question. Um, could people be using e-cigarettes, especially for young adults, I would think. Right? Yeah. Because there's research that shows that young adults, especially young females or high school females, they tend to use smoking as a way to lose weight or to maintain their weight loss. And and so also, it's, yeah, and I also get a sense that, that they that e-cigarettes are more likely to use, they can smoke indoors now. Right, exactly. So you actually might get exactly. some... some a geographic variation based on winter, you know, right. I can smoke inside the house because my, my family won't give me a crap because there's no secondhand smoke that smells like tea. That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, no. that, that's a really good question, actually. Yeah. Um, um, again, and you can get sunshine and weather 
Yes. I, 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 <laughs> So the e-cigarette weight loss question, I think that's a very good question. I don't know of anyone who's actually done that. That's easily done with the data sets that we currently have. And the seasonality with e-cigarette, that's a really good question. The more south yeah, absolutely. Right. Very good. All right. Um, and, and so this was the issue with time shifting. Again, this was the um, study I'd previously referenced. Nielsen basically finding 85%, at least in 2014, 2013, um, were television that was watched live, essentially. We also control for NRT ads, by the way. So we don't just have ads on e-cigarettes. We also have ads on NRT, nicotine replacement therapy. You see a lot of these ads for nicoterm and, and, and these patches and these gums. We actually have data on the same ads for television. These ads don't appear in magazines anymore, and so we're controlling for those ads as well. They just don't end up being significant. It'd be interesting how they coincide with like fast food restaurant ads, um, especially on television. Uh, you know, because what market are they going after? Are they going after people seeking medical advice? Or are they going after people seeking you know, sort of, uh, sensory? Uh, uh, right. Thing? And right. If you're trying to hook people, you go for the sensory. Yeah, I agree. I agree 110%. Um, we, what we find from our models is the selection is negative, meaning that they're going after a market that is less likely to quit smoking. So whoever the individuals are, whatever their characteristics are that make them less likely to quit smoking, they're the ones who are being exposed like, to more ads. To commit to quit all smoking or cigarettes? Cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking. Yeah, because you just... Cigarette, right. Okay. And similar for magazines, we know every magazine that carried the ad. We basically know every magazine that a person reads. We know the frequency in which they're reading it. And so we basically capture the number of ads that appeared in magazines over the past six months. So this is our ad exposure data. Um, you know, on average, a person is exposed to a little over three ads for e-cigarettes on television, almost four ads in magazines, and about 15 ads for nicotine replacement therapy. Per show or per show? Yes, these are six months. This, these are the total number of ads that an average person is exposed to over the past six months. It's a cumulative number of ads. Okay. Generally, people who attempt to quit smoking tend to be exposed to more ads than those who don't, just from our demographics. Right? Um, and in general, for e-cigarettes, people who actually end up quitting successfully tend to be exposed to more ads than those who end up failing, and they tend to be exposed to more ads than those who don't attempt. And do you have a measure of like, the total number of ads that are exposed to the period? Yes. Um, I think that's what this typically tries to get at, right? No, I mean, just any kind of ad. Oh, oh, no, no, that's a, just all ads, all all, ads. unfortunately not. Yeah. So what we had to do when we went to buy data from Cantor is we have to tell them the product category, and then they would pull all the ads for those products that happened on TV and magazines, and so no, we don't have all ads for sure. It's interesting to have the context. That's a, that's a, a yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That's a great words. point, that's a great point. It, it doesn't seem like it, but again, the average consumer is not exposed to that many ads. So this is a mean, but the median consumer is exposed to even zero ads, actually. So this is a very skewed distribution, yeah. Okay. okay. So as I mentioned, there are two big empirical issues with advertising studies. The measure error issue, which we try to, which we try to get, get around. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so there's the measurement error issue, um, and we try to get at that head on, or is this the most salient, most precise measure of advertising used today? So what are you doing? Can I ask a question? Should, should be okay, right? I think. Well, it's, your, your mic's not working. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you need it? Yeah, it's mainly for the San Diego. All right. Okay. You know, I was just I, back to that negative selection question. How, I don't know enough about this market, but how many of the same are they the same companies? I mean, there's Jewel, it's by itself, but are some of these com companies basically double dipping? It seems like right. They they sell both traditional. They do. They do. Um, what happened was initially the cigarette market was very the e-cigarette market was very fragmented. There were a lot of small manufacturers. And then it started consolidating. So now it's the big tobacco, the big cigarette companies that are also producing this these e-cigarette business. So your negative selection result makes a lot of sense. They would want They'd, to target people who aren't going to quit. Exactly, because they don't want to cannibalize their other part. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 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 so
Google. Yep. <laughs> I looked at anything like Google Analytics that you know, like the time when these uh, ads were placed to see like how many searches are yeah. actually happening for each. That, that's a great idea. No, we haven't done that actually. Yeah, that'd be nice to look at Google Trends to kind of see if there's an uptick in searches. Exposure but, or something. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, we haven't done that. That's a great question. Andre, um, you said that e cigarettes are safer and you know they're safer than cigarettes, but how about the NRGs? Is there a comparison? Um, yes. Safer? Yes. Um, so, yes. So, NRT are FDA sanctioned. They're FDA approved. They're considered to be safe. Um, the nicotine content in NRT is a little bit lower than e cigarettes. Um, again, it's a little bit different doses. So, what might make e cigarettes less safer than NRT is not necessarily the nicotine or not necessarily um, you know, how it's being delivered. It could be the fact that the early versions of e cigarettes, you know, they had quality control issues. The additives that were added in to the nicotine liquid. Um, it's um, you know some people had poisonings from the liquid. Sometimes you hear stories about the e cigarette device exploding. So quality control issues in general would make them a little bit less safer than the NRT because NRTs are quality controlled. They've gone through the additives and all of those that has been approved by the FDA. E cigarettes haven't gone through that same review process. I mean, the ads are they advertised with the safest options? So NRT, um, you mean the NRT ads? Yes. No, the NRT ads, because they have been sanctioned for smoking cessation, they can explicitly have people say, I've quit smoking, I've done it with the help of nicotine. They can make these explicitly much stronger statements on the radio. They wouldn't necessarily say that they're safer than e-cigarettes. I don't think any NRT ad actually has compared themselves to e-cigarettes, but they are able to make much stronger statements about what they can do to make e-cigarettes. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that you have around uh, about 30 magazines and so many different channels. So uh, do you consider like categorizing them into broader categories, like in terms of magazines or channels, we might think, right. you know, sports or entertainment, right. lifestyle. I'm just curious that trends in e-cigarette ads, should they differ by categories or I mean, is that captured or even readership and viewership, like in your data, like is it overrepresented in some categories? And maybe that, yeah, so we, we could easily do that with our data. We haven't done a targeting analysis to that level yet. Okay. We actually haven't really seen exactly how many of these ads are say targeted to sports magazines as a category versus men's magazine versus right. these rural hunting in magazines. That's a good, or some health, that's a good point. Yes. Maybe we control for that in the models, but we haven't done a separate analysis just on that. Back, would, you, would you mind, if we have an IT person coming, just a quick change the mic, would you mind, sorry to, oh, you sorry to glue you to that yeah, mic, sure, don't worry. It's fine. Ah, thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. Great, that's totally okay. Somebody's on mute. Oh, right. And the other issue is the targeting bias question, um, and this is what we also want to push on, is to get rid of the endogeneity bias. So here's what we're doing, right? This is our identification mm -hmm. strategy. So our identification strategy is to saturate the models with fixed effects that control for the targeting. Right. So you have these firms that are basically targeting their ads. The ads are not targeted randomly. So you can actually control for this targeting to various degrees. We're going to argue that the residual variation that we have is plausibly exogenous. So first, we include the year by quarter fixed effects. This just gets rid of any trends, any seasonality in advertising and smoking and e-cigarette use. Then we control for fixed effects for the media market. So this basically gets rid of any targeting bias where firms may be targeting certain markets over other markets. Then we control for fixed effects for the show, the channel, the time slot, and the magazine. So if you have some of these manufacturers who are targeting MTV versus Bravo versus Lifetime, we get rid of that. If you have some of these manufacturers that are targeting American Idol versus Law and Order, we're getting rid of that, right? If you have some of these manufacturers who are targeting prime time versus really late night TV, we get rid of that variation. And so in the end, what we have is we have two individuals. They're basically consuming the same types of shows. They're watching the same TV. They're consuming the same magazines. But because they're watching these shows at different times, one is exposed to more ads and one is exposed to less ads, right? And let me show you an example of that. So this is one example of variation that we use. It's a big source of variation for us. So you have person A and person B. They both watch Big Bang Theory on TBS. They both watch Law & Order on USA. Right? Person A just watches Big Bang Theory on TBS at 8.30. Person B watches at 4 p.m. Person A watches Law and Order at 4 p.m. Person B watches Law and Order at 8.30 p.m. So both of these people are watching the same shows, the same time slots, the same channels, 
except there was an ad for e-cigarette that aired on the 8.30 episode of Big Bang Theory, but did not air on the 4 p.m. episode of the Big Bang Theory. And so person A, by definition, is now exposed to more advertising, right? So that's the variation that we're exploiting to get us the causal effect. There's another source of variation that we're exploiting as well. We could have two people that are watching the exact same shows, the same channel, same everything, except one person tends to watch more episodes of these shows and the other person watches less episodes. And so he's more likely to be exposed to more ads just by virtue of him watching more episodes of say Big Bang Theory. Right? Not a variation. You would think that this is not enough variation for us, but we actually do an analysis where we see that after we get rid of the fixed effects, we have about 49% variation remaining in a TV ad exposure. That's this identifying variation. And we have about 32% in the magazine ad exposure that's this identifying variation. So these fixed effects are not getting rid of all our variation. We still have enough variation left over um, to basically do the analysis. Um, so maybe I can skip over this. All this is basically showing is that if you look at ad exposure across different socioeconomic factors, it does differ, right? Ad exposure is not randomly distributed across individuals. Some groups are exposed to more, some groups are exposed to less. What we want to do is that we would hope that our identification strategy gets rid of that variation. We want our identification strategy to make sure that the observables are all balanced across ad exposure. And we actually end up checking this, right? So if you basically don't do anything, you see that ad exposure is actually correlated quite strongly with a lot of these sociodemographic factors. When we net out all of the fixed effects, essentially all of those p-values, they go to basically very high insignificant p-values, right? So when we add in all of our saturated fixed effects, ad exposure is not correlated with the socio-demographic factors. It balances out the observables. Is this largely the information that firms have when they're making That's correct. Decisions? That's exactly right, yeah. They have all of this information. What we don't know that they might know is how they're using this information. There could be some nonlinear formula, or there could be some nonlinear matching of these characteristics that they could be using to basically target further. We have the information, we just don't know what's their formula, what's their equation that basically takes from step A to step B. We're seeing a gender difference. Yes, yeah, so there's a slight gender difference. It goes down tremendously, but there is a slight gender difference. So yes, yes. I was, well, I was wondering whether you'd separate between gender versus ads. If there are some ads that emphasize yeah. females versus males, that would be an interesting interaction. Right now, we haven't separated on gender because, as they pointed out, we have power issues, right. um, unfortunately. So we are not able to separate gender. But we can try for We can just add an interaction term and see if there's a gender. Well, I'm also wondering about the ads themselves, too, because you have information on that. Right. To see if they're on lifetime, for instance, or right. something like that. Yeah, yeah please. Did you include it like as a control variable or something like cigarette tax and the air, like uh, air smoking air free laws? Yes. Thank, thank you for pointing that out. Um, so I'm not sure if it's in this version, but yeah, we have, I think it might be the newer version. Um, yeah, we, we control for the cigarette taxes. We also control for e-cigarette prices. Um, there's not enough taxes on e-cigarettes to be able to control for that, but we have price data on e-cigarettes uh, and we control for the smoke free air laws as well. So our baseline specification, it's a multinomial logit. We are basically modeling three choices. Um, do you, uh, um, you, you have individuals who are attempting to quit smoking and they succeed. You have individuals who are attempting to quit smoking and they fail. And then you have individuals who just do not attempt to quit smoking, right? And that's a function of all of these ad exposure variables. It's a function of all the demographics and all the fixed effects. And our standard errors are clustered at the household level. So these are results from multinomial logit. I'll quickly just walk you guys through some of these. Um, each column represents a separate model, right? Each of these sort of reported coefficients is the marginal effect, and you want to read that as the marginal effect of a change in the probability for each outcome with respect to an increase in ad exposure of one ad, right? And as you're moving from model one through model five, basically the models are progressively getting richer. And so model five is the model that's a preferred model that controls for all of the saturated fixed effects. <laughs> the first thing, we don't find anything on magazines. Magazine ads, no significant effect on quits, no significant effects on failures, no significant effect on attempts, right? It's possible that's very easy to just flip the page. It's possible that not a lot of people are being exposed to magazine advertising. Um, for whatever reason, they're not having an effect. 
TV ads, however, we do find that they have some effect on attempts. It's not significant here, but in the later models I show you, you will see that it actually is increasing attempts. So being exposed to an ad for e-cigarettes on television makes it more likely that that person will actually now attempt to quit smoking. Okay. You also see that it's not affecting failure. So it's not affecting the probability of a failure, but it is significantly increasing the probability of a successful quit. Right. How big is that effect? So that's basically saying that if I'm exposed to one additional ad on TV, it's raising the probability of a successful quit by about 0.1 percentage point. And that's over six months. That's one ad over six. That's one ad over six months. Very good, exactly. Right. It's not a big effect, but it's, again, it's not a big treatment. But it's only one ad. I'm lost here. Yes, Karen. So these should be mostly mutually exclusive. Correct. So it's quit. Failure to, you, you attempt but you fail? Right. So what's attempt? You know attempt? No, thank you. So technically, yes, these are mutually similar. So the attempt is technically do not attempt. Do so not. we just flipped it over to make it easier to interpret. Oh. So our three categories would be quit, failure, and do not attempt. Do not right? And so in that case, that probably would be negative 0.007. Okay. So if you add all three together, you've got a bad zero, right? So that's mutually exclusive. Okay. Good point. Thanks. I'm assuming the probability is not additive if you see two ads, three ads, four ads. So this is just from a scale perspective. It's just an additional ad. Remember, the, the logit is, is nonlinear, but for the most part, it's linear with the range that we're measuring. So it will be additive in some sense. Two ads will be about two percentage points and so on. Okay. Just the mic. Okay. So what's going on? Um, it's just on the computer. Okay. The batteries are dead. Ah, the batteries are dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the light's on. It, it says dead battery on it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many saw this study? I just saw the light, you know? <laughs> I think it takes more than 50. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. It's not our fault. It's coincidental with them touching it against the thing. That make thank you. That makes total sense, guys. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I got I got my mobility back. Yes. Okay. This is where you don't confuse Friday after special. You have three categories. Correct. Yes. So these aren't relative to anything? No, no. So, so technically, in the multinomial logic, the base category is attempt, right? So that's your reference category. Okay. But you can still get the probability of okay. just a quit. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's not a fourth category. Yes. They, no, not a fourth. Thank you. That's a good point. Okay. And so your interpretation is It just, exactly. Oh, I got it. Sure. Right. Um, okay. What am I doing here? Yeah, so this was just showing the negative selection, right? As you go from model one to model five, our quit effects are getting stronger, which is consistent with the negative selection story that I was talking about. All right. So if our advertising exposure really is, oh, right, I'm running out of time, so I'll speed up a little bit. If our advertising exposure is really um, plausibly exogenous, then if we take out NRT exposure from our models, it should not do anything, right? Because if you have plausibly exogenous variation in your exposure to e-cigarette ads, it should not be correlated with anything else. So we take out NRT, very much same story. Again, just a robustness check. Right. We change our look back period, four months, six months. We depreciate it over six months. We depreciate it over 12 months. We basically find effects on attempt. So more e-cigarette ads on TV makes it more likely that you will attempt to quit smoking. It makes it more likely that you will quit successfully. Nothing on failures. So again, very, very similar effects. And the elasticities are all in the ballpark about 0 0.03, 0 0.05. One public health concern was all these e-cigarette TV ads crowding out NRT, right? So NRT is a sanctioned device by the FDA, right? E-cigarettes are not. Could these individuals now be substituting from NRT to e-cigarettes? Short answer, no. We don't find any evidence of that. What we're finding is that e-cigarette ads makes you more likely to attempt to quit smoking. And some of you guys are attempting using e-cigarettes. Some of you guys are attempting using NRT. Some of you guys are attempting using cold turkey. It's not changing the methods of your attempt. Then we look at among those people who attempt, so this is a sample that's restricted only to attempters, does watching an e-cigarette ad make it more likely that your attempt will be successful, right? For all attempters, everyone who's attempted to quit smoking, watching an e-cigarette ad makes it more likely that your attempt will be successful. 
Okay, so it raises what we call the success rate, right? This also results in a nice robustness check, a placebo check. If it's increasing the success rate, it should only increase the success rate for those people who are actually using e-cigarettes to quit. It should not be increasing the success rate for the people using other methods. And so when we do that, we find, yes, it increases the success rate for those people who are attempting to quit using e-cigarettes. But if you are attempting using NRT, cold turkey, other methods, there's no change in the success rate. So think of that as a placebo check. We don't expect an effect there. We're not finding an effect there. How much of our effect is coming from attempts? How much of our effect is coming from the success rate? Right, so let me summarize that. We are finding that more ads on TV is leading to more successful quits. That could be happening for two reasons. It could be happening because more people are just attempting to quit, or it could be happening because each attempt is now more successful, right? We're finding that about 20% of it is coming from more people attempting to quit. About 80% of it is coming from just each attempt now being more successful, right? But that's an interesting result. You know, why is that the case? Why is e-cigarettes raising the success rate, right? And we don't have a good answer for that. The only thing we can think of is that it's reinforcing some message for these individuals who are being exposed to those ads. This is a prison success rate relative to what? Cold turkey? No, it's just the, uh, it's the success rate relative to not using e-cigarettes. Not, uh, not being exposed to the ads. So if you're not exposed to the ads, okay. if you're not exposed to the ads, you will have some success rate, right? If you're exposed to the ads, your success rate is now higher. No matter what kind of attempt you're- Right, so no, but we're finding that only for the e-cigarette attempts. Okay. Right. So the only thing we can think of is we're borrowing from the pharmaceutical literature. So there, there's a lot of studies that show that suppose I have high cholesterol, I'm already taking Lipitor, and if I see an ad for Lipitor, it actually reinforces me to make sure I take my Lipitor on time. It reinforces me that I don't um, miss a dose. And so e-cigarettes could be serving that purpose. They could be reinforcing for these individuals, hey, you know, it's important, e-cigarettes are good, you should continue your quitting attempt, you know, don't fall back, right? But we are finding a strong effect on success rate, and that's our explanation thus far. Right. This is just another robustness check. I can quit that. Um, it's a placebo check. Another placebo check, future ad effects, right? If our effects really are causal and we add effects of the future ad exposure that should not change our main results and the future ad exposure should be big, precise zeros, right? If I'm exposed to an ad in the future, it should not be impacting my behavior today. If it is, that's evidence of targeting selection bias. So when we add future ad exposure to our models, again, these are nice and insignificant, very precise zeros. Differential effects by age, right? We basically look at young adults, 18 to 34, and older adults just by nature of our sample size. We basically find generally that more e-cigarette ads on TV tends to lead to more attempts for both groups, but it raises the success rate more for the young adults than it does for the older adults. There might be two reasons for that. Older adults are long-term smokers. They're already addicted to smoking. They have a strong addictive stock, so it's harder for them to quit smoking. And also Kip Viscusi has an interesting paper on this too, um, on, on perceptions. And he finds that yes, all adults tend to misperceive the risk of e-cigarettes, but older adults tend to misperceive the risks more than younger adults. So if these guys are misperceiving the risk more, then they might be less impacted by the ads based on that. In my final summary, I think I'm okay on time here. So we're presenting our first causal evidence on e-cigarette advertising on television and magazine and quits. We're basically finding no effects on magazine ads, but the e-cigarette ads on TV are raising cessation attempts. It's raising the success rate of these attempts. And we're finding that most of the effect is coming from the success rate rather than the increase in the attempt. We don't find any evidence that being exposed to e-cigarette ads is making you switch from NRT to e-cigarettes. Right? How much can our effects explain this declining trend in smoking? Not a lot, right? Again, advertising was going up. Our advertising effects are significant. They're not huge. They're plausibly small. So essentially, if there was no ads on TV for e-cigarettes, smoking rates over 2010 to 2015 would have been about 3% higher. 
The other kind of interesting policy implication of our ads and our, of our results is the following. So we know that adults misperceive the risk of e-cigarettes. They always overestimate the risk. There is evidence that that misperception has actually gotten worse, right? So five years ago, 50% of adults said e-cigarettes are as bad or more or worse than cigarettes. Today, it's two thirds, right? So we know that e-cigarettes are not worse than cigarettes. So there is some sort of role here for maybe some regulated advertising to sort of break that information asymmetry. So maybe it's not a good thing if the FDA were to ban advertising completely. And finally, another policy implication, my last slide, suppose the FDA were to completely ban e-cigarette ads, right? What would happen? Based on our data, it would suggest that there would be 105,000 fewer quitters overall. Oh, um, yes, per year, thank you, yes, indeed. The other thing is, what would happen if the FDA actually encouraged e-cigarette ads? What if they actually encouraged advertising of e-cigarettes? In that case, it's possible that e-cigarette manufacturers may reach the same levels of advertising as the NRTs. If that were to happen, that would lead to about 350,000 additional quitters, right? Keep in mind that our results are only one side of the debate, right? This is telling you what's going on with adults, right? These are the benefits for adults. You know, this of course needs to be balanced against what's going on with kids, which is for another day. So thank you very much for listening, guys. Appreciate it. Yes, yeah, please. So, so is it crowding out? You said it, it's not crowding out the NRTs. Is it crowding out cold turkey or no? New people. So it's kind of just a substitute for the nicotine substitute. Exactly right. It's not crowding out anything. So there's an increase in attempt, but the shares of people using different attempts are basically staying constant. Is, is your sense of the public health community sort of open-minded to sort of to, 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 to No, so what's going on is they were open-minded. The FDA a couple of years ago actually even was open to the possibility that they might sanction e-cigarettes as a cessation aid. But when they're seeing this data for kids, they're, taking, they're starting to take a hard stance on this. So the, the Scott Gottlieb, he basically said that I'm waiting for one more, well, he's, he's an outgoing commissioner, right? They say the FDA is waiting for one more year of data on kids. If that data shows a similar uptick, then they might even consider banning. Yeah. Yeah. What, is, what do we teach kids like in health classes or in high schools about the dangers? I mean, I think part of the, the perception that cigarettes are more dangerous comes from the fact that kids are using it. Correct. We worry about kids and, uh, and so, no, absolutely. For kids, you know, kids should not be using e-cigarettes, right? Um, you know, there, it's nicotine, it's addiction. If they basically prolong the habit, you know, are e-cigarettes better than smoking? Yes. Are e-cigarettes better than all cessation? No. Right. I mean, I guess I remember back from high school where I was told, you know, terrible things about marijuana that are not really supported by right. the, the, right. the medical literature, right? right? And right. I'm wondering if the same thing happens now with e-cigarettes. Uh, sort of reacting to the, to the use yeah. and, and, and that, that misinformation is then filtering out to adults. Right. That's, that's a very good point. Um, again, this is, again, more research that could be done on this, right? People can actually start looking at how is e-cigarette use among kids impacting their schooling outcomes, their grades, all of their social activities, their other behaviors. I mean, it's the same level of research that we were doing with tobacco. We can now start applying that to e-cigarettes as well. Yeah. I think you said earlier in your talk that the FDA was looking in 2022 to pull e-cig products off the market until they achieve like written approval by the FDA. Correct. So is, do you think the FDA doesn't care about, at least for, old, for older adults, that this could be used as a succession aid? Or they're just so focused on the youth margin that they're just throwing it aside? Well, that's a great point. So not quite. So early on, I would say until 2017, they really were very open to e-cigarettes and harm reduction, right? That's why they're still allowing advertising to continue in magazines and television. They did not listen to those states saying, hey, we should ban this. And that's why they actually postponed that requirement. If they had followed through on that requirement, all e-cigarette products would have been basically pulled from the market. Right now, I think they've moved a little bit further away from that stance. I think that stance is still there. It's still a wait and see approach, but with the kids' data, now they're trying to think, hey, we should think about, hey, um, are the costs for kids outweighing the benefits for the adults? Yeah. 